Good morning, everybody. Hey there. Hello, hello. Good morning. Yeah, we're going to have to do this the hard way. Hey, everyone. Hi. I hate to break up this great conversation, but we do have a vague schedule that I need to kind of keep to. I mean, much as I love and I'm going to love spending all day with you, we should sort of get this moving. So do please refill your coffee, get more sugar and carbohydrates, come grab a seat. I'm going to talk this. I'm going to be repeating myself a few times, although I actually have been ambulatory for several hours. I'm still asleep. So I am Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. On behalf of HDC, thank you so much for joining us at our 25th annual conference, if you can imagine such a thing. I know there are some people here who have actually been with us all 25 years. Wow. Yeah, right? I'm unfortunately one of those as well. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, because preservationists enjoy commemorating things and also doing reenactments, this snow this morning, which has dampened some of our participation, is a reenactment of the first one 25 years ago, where we had two feet of snow at the time. So um, I'm, what's going to happen now is I'm just going to go through a little bit of the technical, uh, technical uh, thank yous and whatnot and what we're all going to do. I'm then going to introduce Dan Allen, who's going to be charming and inspirational. He will then introduce our keynote speaker. I will then get back up and bore you some more, and then we get into the conference proper. Um, people at the Preservation Th Fair, thank you all so very, very much. The fair will be ongoing. Um, so uh, you, honestly, you should feel free to visit with them. Uh, but people at the fair also are very much encouraged to come to panels. So it's just a good gathering place. No one's going to take anything if you want to leave things there, and people can rifle through the stuff, collect materials. All right. First order of business is thank you, of course, to our, uh, to our funders. Support is provided for the conference in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the New York City Council and by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. Additional support for the conference and all of HGC's educational programming is provided by New York City Council members Margaret Chin, Bob Holden, Corey Johnson, Ben Kalos, Stephen Levin, and Keith Powers. Uh, so thank them all very much. We would not be able to do this. You would probably have your Saturdays to yourself without their proper support. Um, there are, let me explain the format here. I know that some of you have done this before. But just to refresh, and again, like I said, I probably do not intend really on waking up until about 11.30 in the morning. Um, there are two program panels, one of them at 11 o'clock entitled Old Faces, New Places, and one of them at 2.45 entitled Zoning for Better or for Worse. All panels will be held upstairs on the third floor. Um, after the 11 a.m. panel and immediately after lunch, there will be participant-driven panels. You, have, you can see that there are a number of those on the whiteboard, taped to the whiteboard out, out front. That's what you vote on with your little red dots. You put the red dots on. Um, and then we will carefully and scientifically uh, count them and then create the schedule. Uh, the whiteboards with all the session information will be along the wall. I already said that. And you have until 10.40 to cast your vote. The, the final schedule will be unveiled in the hall, uh, will be unveiled about 10.45 or 10.50, which is why I'm trying to keep everybody to this essential schedule. Yeah. Um, I'd like to give a warm thanks to the HCC staff who does all this. Again, I simply stand here wearing black and talking while I'm asleep. They do all the work. Um, to uh, Jesse Denno, Michelle Arbelou, Nora Kelly, um, our wonderful uh, Diego, um, our, vo our volunteer Liz, uh, all of whom have done great work just uh, keeping this all together. We have another 
added fun part of the conference this year, a new thing. We can have new things. Sometimes we can even have nice things, but we can have new things, definitely. Which is that uh, Nora and Alex, Nora is wandering around with the video, um, will be taking sort of video statements and trying to capture people's stories. So you should go make sure to talk to Nora the idea of capturing you know, your preservation story uh, in a very short statement so that we can then project it out because as much as this very full room shows and we'll all have a chance to talk to each other, it's even better when we have things to be able to project out for the people who didn't, didn't get up early enough to hear you the first time. So um, I hope everyone's excited by that. We think it's going to be fun. I've reached the point where I now introduce HTC's president, Dan Allen. Mr. Allen is a preservation architect, a, a teacher at uh, the Columbia University for graduate graduate program for architecture planning and preservation, and um, a long and, and a man named Dan Allen. So. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Good. I'm famous for not speaking loudly enough, um, among other things. So that actually, that quote, a man named Dan Allen, comes from, I think it was Curbed that wanted to write about testimony that I gave about the clock tower in Long Island City. Can you hear? OK. Uh, and he couldn't figure out who I was, so he just referred to me as a man named Dan Allen. So <laughs> I continue to be that man. I want to thank you all for coming. And it's hard to believe it's 25 years. Uh, the 25th Annual Preservation Conference. This event is important. It's more than any other uh, on HTTC's roster. It brings together members of the preservation community to reflect, talk, and strategize about the state of things, but also to be energized for the work ahead. And there's a lot of work ahead. We are a small but mighty community, which is a good thing, since the tasks ahead will require concerted effort. By way of kicking off today's proceedings, I want to mention, since last year's conference, the city's preservationists, the people in this room, have fought hard to protect the city's character and to save the places that matter. We have seen success in our efforts of late. After years of striving and decades on the National Register of Historic Places, portions of Sunset Park are on the verge of becoming a landmark district. Additionally, Bay Ridge, yeah, let's hear it, come on. <laughs> Bay Ridge is finally receiving some attention from the LPC, and there even appears to be movement on gaining some long sought protections for one of my favorite areas, Tin Pan Alley. Hard as it is to believe, the birthplace of the American Songbook is still not a cultural landmark in the eyes of the city, and we are working to change that. Each of the advancements has something in common. A fierce group of preservationists holding rallies, sending e-blasts, writing letters to elected officials, testifying at hearings, lawyer lawyering up, that's a hard word, showing up and speaking out. And that's a good thing. The city is changing more rapidly than ever, rezoning, Rezonings have been announced for fragile historic areas such as Soho and Gowanus. Areas in Queens and the Bronx are coping with never before seen levels of development pressure and real estate prices across the city are skyrocketing. Now more than ever, we need to show up and keep showing up. Earlier this month, on a sad note, we lost a true landmark lion and a friend of mine, Jack Taylor, champion of Union Square and Ladies Mile, um, who passed away at home at the age of 93. As many of you who knew him, could attest Jack was not a person who would shy away from any fight or leave well enough alone. He campaigned for the landmark designation of Tammany Hall for over 30 years and protested greatly when LPC allowed the rooftop addition, which is currently rising. He shined a light on buildings of, with great social worth, which might not seem to be immediate landmarks, but were immeasurable, of immeasurable value to New Yorkers, places like the Dvorak House and Lou Chow's. Through his devotion to these cultural landmarks, he broadened the reach of preservation. And even when he was not successful in preserving these places, Jack never let you forget about it. He never let you forget one of his favorite places for one minute. More than anything, Jack never gave up. He always showed up. Year after year, going to meetings and hearings and more hearings, his steadfastness was as characteristic of Jack as his typewritten notes, uh, typewritten post-it notes. We all need to be more like him going to the future. I have a, a beloved collection of typewritten Jack Taylor notes, as I know many of you do. <laughs> it's now my pleasure to introduce another fighter for our city, Councilmember Ben Kalos, a man who loves old buildings and hates scaffolding. 
Elected to represent the 5th Council District on Manhattan's east side in 2013, Councilman Kalis has fought to protect his district and the rest of the city from the rampant overdevelopment, which is sweeping our city. As past chair of the Government Operations Committee, he sought to root out patronage, deprivatize government, eliminate billions in waste, expand elections, and to use technology to improve access to government. He has become a leading advocate for education, affordable housing, public health, sustainable development, and transportation improvements and safety. In his current role as chair of the Subcommittee on Planning, Dispositions, and Concessions, he is focused on preserving and building new affordable housing, overseeing every deal made by the city closely to ensure that New Yorkers are actually getting the affordable housing they need. Councilmember Kalos is also working to empower communities in the planning process to create opportunities for minority and woman-owned small businesses. His office is open and transparent with con constituents invited to decide how to spend $1 million on local projects in the district, as well as to join him in a conversation on the first Friday of each month, or he will go to them if he can gather 10 neighbors. For Ben is your building, a lifelong Upper East Sider, please welcome Council Member Ben Kalos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you got it. Good morning. Good morning. One more time, let's wake up Simeon. Good morning. That is more like it. Thank you to HDC President and Professor Dan Allen. I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. For those of you who happen to use social media, you can hit me at Ben Kalos. I am so incredibly grateful for an opportunity to speak to an audience of preservationists and activists from all over the city. Uh, I wanted to share three important messages today. Uh, the first is making preservation accessible. The second is how to deal with elected officials. And the third is what you can accomplish if you do the first two right. So first we need to talk about how to make preservation accessible. And I didn't know I was a preservationist when I got elected. Thanks to Simeon Bankoff and the Historic District Council, as well as local groups like Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, I've become more and more of a preservationist. Uh, my critics and allies will tell you that I am the strongest advocate on the City Council for preservation. And this scares me because I still don't understand the significance of the architectural styles. I'm not sure I ever will. Uh, but one thing I wanted to share is a, a story that recently happened. So new construction on the Upper East Side recently uncovered a facade of an old church from 1898. I thought it was cool, and I always wondered what it was, but no one else knew either. A local reporter named Doug Fiden uh, from our town noticed it, found out it was the church from St. Joseph's Orphan Asylum, and told its story from 1857 through today. This caught the attention of the Reverend Boniface Ramsey, a priest best known for warning the Vatican against the appointment of Theodore E. McCarrick to, Bish to Archbishop in 2000. Turns out he was right about McCarrick, and as the sole reverend for the current St. Joseph's only three blocks away, we want a strong advocate for the preservation of this facade. As you may have read in the New York Times, uh, the headline was, the private school versus the radical priest. The attention and pressure led the Spence School to offer to place a memorial plaque on the outside of the new building and include a permanent exhibit on the inside. Incidentally, they actually ended up choosing to preserve the existing facade using mineral wool, and I actually just hope one day it will actually reemerge to the surprise and delight of future generations who might Google and find this New York Times story about uh, what had happened here and what it is and what it was. Uh, the first takeaway is to make preservation accessible by telling the story of what you are trying to preserve. Who used it? How do I identify with this population today? Do we feel something for them, such as sympathy for orphans or affinity with prior immigrants and changing communities? The second takeaway is to repackage hyper-technical requests for evaluations into a one-page release that tells the story as you would want to read it in your local paper, complete with quote from the right people and historic photographs to capture the imagination. If all else fails, convert it to a guest column or a letter to the editor. 
It doesn't matter if it is the local free paper, patch, or a local blog, as long as it gets eyeballs and attention, who knows, the New York Times might notice and write about it. Next is how to deal with elected officials. Uh, so I'd like to cover working with the ones you've got, what elected officials can really do, and choosing your elected officials. Now, you can't always get what you want. No, you can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you find you get what you need, said the immortal Keith Richards and Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. Uh, and I'm not sure if we need preservations if we have immortals with us. That's a bad joke. But so here's the secret. Most elected officials are doing what they do because they are insecure and seeking the approval and they never got from some place that they will never ever actually get. <laughs> now, historic preservations, preservationists know a lot. It can be intimidating, especially to insecure elected officials who are faking it till they make it and whose worst nightmare is being exposed. So start off by acknowledging that you've got the expertise and that there's no expertise expected from anyone else in the room, and that all you're looking for is their public support. If you're willing to provide material for staff to work from, or even draft testimony for the elected official to read or submit, you've just made getting to yes a lot easier. Because most elected officials, who clearly aren't me, are risk averse, getting the support of proposed landmarks owners or a block association or neighborhood association and community board can let the elected official know they can do something nice for you without making any enemies. If you can't do all that and you're still determined, build the support you can, bring local media, let your elected know that your support will outweigh the opposition. After all, and I quote, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, as Spock said in The Wrath of Khan. This is important in building support. Handing elected officials a petition with signatures on it will have literally have no effect. The purpose of a petition is to collect names, addresses, and most importantly, email addresses, so you can send a free message in seconds that will mobilize dozens, hundreds, or thousands to take an action like showing up at a pivotal hearing. Your ability to build a list of people interested in what you're doing is where your power will come from and is a potential great source for funding. I built my list from 2,500 as an activist to 7,000 as a first-time candidate to 25,000 as an elected official and over 60,000 as a candidate for 2021. Now, why do elected officials actually matter? Well, that depends on what they are actually willing to do. Let me start by saying, as an elected official, I do not have a magic wand. Now, I do have a replica Harry Potter, but that doesn't count. When you've got an elected official on your side, here's how we can help. Elected officials have the bully pulpit. I invited 60,000 people to this conference from my mailing list when I learned I would be a keynote. If you invite an elected official to speak, do it a month or two in advance, and do it with the caveat that they either include it in their email, or at the very least that they promote it on social media. When the press is ignoring the story we have to tell, reporters will take my call because they need me to take theirs. And with my own record, and with my on the record support, that might be a necessary element to get the story written. Now, you can Google your elected officials and the paper you want to be in to see who writes about them or your topic. Ask the elected to help place your story as an exclusive. You'd be surprised how successful we've been uh, in that. Elected officials can be a draw to your meeting or can host a meeting in the community to build support. Uh, we do, we've done an overdevelopment forum in my district every single year. It is actually the most widely attended event. We actually have to get a bigger venue because the venue can't hold more than 150 people. And we've had to turn people away. Now, one caveat in terms of working with elected officials is 
never back a wild animal into a corner, uh, as the saying goes. There's no harm in sharing the topic or the ask ahead of time. I know you might be concerned that the elected official won't show up, but if they don't, you've got a soft no. And now you can start having a, you have a starting point and you can work on convincing them. When an elected official sends a letter to an agency, they usually have to respond, especially if the letter is handed to the press. Elected officials sign letters all the time that they don't care about. When elected officials sign a letter, ask each of them to follow up with a phone call with the head of the agency. Elected officials should also read their testimony at a hearing. It shows the administration that they care. Always follow up politely to make sure that they do. Elected officials can convene other elected officials and request meetings with relevant agencies like the Department of City Planning or the Landmarks Preservation Commission. If the agency is engaged and asks lots of questions or rebuffs your position, that's actually a good thing. Uh, if they sit there quietly, say nothing, then that's a courtesy meeting and that's usually a waste of everybody's time. Make sure you know what kind of meeting you're requesting, what kind of meeting you're in, and what you hope to gain from the meeting. Elected officials have a vote, which they can tie to anything. After all, politics can be entirely transactional. An elected official can refuse to move forward on a rezoning that the mayor wants until a rezoning or landmarks or school seats that they've requested have been addressed. New York City Council members have around half a million dollars a year in discretionary grants that they can give to nonprofits in the neighborhood that can reimburse your activities. An elected official can be asked to put their money where their mouth is and invest it into preservation groups. I've allocated roughly half a million dollars to preservation groups since I've been in office over the past five years. Elected account. <laughs> Elected officials, particularly council members and borough presidents, make appointments to the community boards. I, for one, have been accused of stacking the deck because if you look at community board eight five years ago, they were very much pro-development and now it is about 50% plus one or two votes preservationist. Uh, and so that is a, yeah. That, that is something you can do and just community board applications uh, were due on the 26th. If Please encourage people to become public members of their boards. You can put in letters of recommendation, you can be references, but the goal would be to take over your community boards, please. Ultimately, elected officials have knowledge that you do not and if they are on your side, the most important thing they can do is to be honest. Honest about what is going on. Who is pushing back? What's on the table? What we can get? And whether fighting for more is on the table or might actually be successful. If the elected official says they are helping you, but you don't know what's going on, then they aren't helping you. This gets to the most important point. You can choose your elected officials, and even as nonprofits, you cannot shy away from it because real, the real estate industry is going to pride themselves on choosing your next elected official to raise your community and replace it with the tallest and most expensive buildings they can get. As nonprofits, you can circulate questionnaires and publish the answers to the questionnaires online. You can host debates on preservation and land use in your neighborhood. To be most effective, you can publish policy positions ahead of time. I like to call that the answer key. Uh, while it may have the effect of getting the same answers from all the candidates, the good news is you'll have the, them all on record no matter who wins. You can also take positions on legislation. I want to thank Historic Districts Council because there's one thing I've been trying to get done for five years. It was the thing I ran for office to, it was one of the things I, I, I wanted to make the city council full time. I did that. I wanted to get rid of, si rid of something called Lulu's, which is legal grease they gave to council members to do whatever the speaker wanted. It was like $8,000. I said no to $64,000. Got that done. But the last piece is uh, where do elected officials get their money from? I, I, I heard real estate, and, and that was the correct answer. And so. Uh, you're about preservation, but 
we asked Historic District Council to join us in taking position in favor of legislation I was working on for a full public match. The issue was that candidates were getting most of their money from big dollars, and a lot of those big dollars were coming from real estate. And when you're running for mayor and you need to raise seven million dollars, and you're going to get three million dollars from the city because that was the public match, 55 uh, percent, you're going to go for three million dollars from somewhere else, and it's either 15,000 small dollar contributions, and just so you know, that's humanly impossible, or it's uh, going to, uh, I used to have the math off the top of my head, I think it's 500 contributions of $5,100. Has anyone here ever given anyone $5,100 without asking for anything in return? Let's, let's hang out later. <laughs> Uh, I, I will say for my part, I once offered somebody something around that, but I expected her to spend the rest of her life with me. <laughs> she said yes, our daughter's 13 month, months old. But the uh, key thing here is uh, that's how we were operating our elections. We tried to get the legislation passed last term. We couldn't. This term, I kind of gave up on the city council, and I uh, actually worked with the mayor. He gets a lot of criticism from me, probably from this room. But we went around the council. We went to the ballot. And 1.1 million people voted for campaign finance reform to get big money out of New York City politics. That's more people than voted for the mayor on the Democrat and Republican line in 2017. So that is, that is yes. And so now we can get 75% of the money we need from public dollars. It mean, you get 15% from the public to raise that and then there's 15% left, which is still too much. I'm hoping folks will consider joining me and getting to a full public match so that there will be no big dollars. No one would need to take money more than 175, more than 250. But what this did is it allowed a group called uh, New York Communities for Change, and I would hope that preservation voters would consider asking for a similar pledge. But they asked everyone for a public advocate. Incidentally, I wrote a law saying that the November rule would apply for public advocate. They asked everyone not to take corporate money, not to take corporate PAC money, and not to take real estate money. On February 26, New York City elected the first citywide elected official who didn't take any real estate money. So please, 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 we need to keep that going. Now, in non-election years, you can still do a lot. You can hold forums. Uh, Actually, the non-election years are actually few and far between. 2019 was supposed to be a non-election year. Uh, we have this public advocate special elections. Uh, what else are we voting for in November? And ju judges, what else? Something else will be on the ballot this year. The charter. So this is a good year to help rewrite the charter. Incidentally, I submitted testimony, and the Charter Revision Commission has agreed to look into the makeup of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, the makeup of City Planning Commission. Uh, I'm not sure that they're going to go as far as I'd like them to go, which would be to say that the council and uh, borough presidents would be co-equal with the mayor. The mayor would not control city planning in our city. Uh, but I think that with your advocacy, we can write the city's charter and what people vote on. Ultimately, once it's on the ballot, you can do educational forums to educate people about what we ultimately get to, and that will be incredibly important. In 2020, the Senate and the Assembly will be up for another election. Now, this is actually probably the last election that will matter to the Assembly and the Senate. This is a new regime with Democrats in control of both houses, and you should be able to communicate to them that uh, you have certain expectations of them if they want to be reelected. And with a, a blue wave and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez taking out incumbents and a lot of the senators who are in now having taken out incumbents themselves, they will be sensitive. 2020 only. After 2020, if they win an election, they're going to feel very safe and secure. So I would say if you have things you want to get done, it's between now and June and next year. But you can do the questionnaires. You can let folks know where you are now and make sure that they do so. In 2021, we will be electing, we will, the, the following offices will be termed out, which is an open seat. The mayor, the controller, and a super majority of the city council. Now you may think that 2021 is far away, but for me it is two years, three months, 28 days, 13 hours, and uh, 22 minutes and 17 seconds away. 
And I can tell you, if you're reading the New York Times or what have you, 2021 is well underway. And so just want to speak to you as individuals now. As individuals, you can recruit people to run for office, or you can run for office yourself. Now, I have a deep, dark secret that's open to the public about government. Women are underrepresented. You make up the majority of the city, but I believe you have 11 women in the city council out of 51. It's just as dismal on the state level. We need more women to run for office. I see a lot of the women in this room. I've already asked at least one or two in this room to run for office. Please consider running for office. Uh, please use your personal email, your personal social media to share messages that are important to you. As an elected official, I have a government account that's at Ben Kalos, and I have my personal account, which is at Kalos, and I'm able to do different communications from different accounts. You are allowed to do the same. Last but not least, you can raise money for candidates that you like, and you can give money. We're, telling, we're saying that we're asking candidates not to take real estate money, and I hope you will join us in doing so, but it's got to come from somewhere. If we're not going to take from the people who have it, we need to take it from the people who don't, which is folks in the preservation community who are willing to reach in and take $10, which means a lot, but that's the only way we'll do it. The good news, it'll be matched eight to one. So here's a question. So I've talked to you about what elected officials can do. I've talked to you, I've given you a lot of advice on how to get your message out there and what have you. What's the upside? Why is it worth doing all this? And so I'll just share a little bit of what you can accomplish when you can elect council members and others without real estate money. You can fast track requests for evaluations using the council's power of advice and consent. Uh, there hasn't been a landmarks commissioner who has gotten appointed by the council that hasn't had to go through for me first. And in those conversations, when that is happening, you can actually submit to your elected officials lists of people you'd like to be considered. I've played a role in actually getting certain people appointed to certain boards. Uh, you can also say, listen, these are the things that we want you to ask at the hearing. And uh, because of the no ambush rule, I'll usually sit down with the person ahead of time to say, like, this is what I'm going to ask you. Let's decide if we're going to have a bad hearing or a good hearing and whether you're going to actually make it through. Uh, sometimes I get my best questions from people in this room. Uh, one of my colleagues who uh, I actually do like, though we spent a lot of time fighting, who's no longer in the council, uh, and I had very different opinions on preservation. He was so much so that he introduced a bill saying that if you apply for uh, preservation for an RFE, and it was a, a decal if it was decalendared or what have you, that he wanted there to be a five-year moratorium, which is great for developers because they know that those buildings are are in limbo for five years and they can't be protected, so let's bulldoze that neighborhood and replace it with those uh, luxury high rises. And so we were able to work as an advocacy community with council member Rosie Mendez and Gail Brewer where we convened a meeting citywide and now speaker Corey Johnson, I wanna give a shout out to Andrew Berman for his role in that, HDC's role, friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts and MAS, we were able to pull that clause out. Uh, We've been able to, in addition to giving money to preservation groups, I've given funding to each of my community boards, about five to $10,000 to pay for a planner. The planner I've been very lucky to get is named George Janes. Uh, he's a frequent uh, partner in collaboration or if you're in real estate crime. Uh, and because of the expertise that he lends the organizations, we've really been able to fight back. And uh, the community boards will actually all be getting new planners and I'll be watching to make sure that those planners work for the community boards, not the mayor. Uh, at 180 East 88th Street, we plant challenged the first gerrymandered zoning lot. We went to court, we lost, we went to the BSA, we lost. I'm not done yet, we're gonna work with anyone in this room who's interested to fight those gerrymandered zoning lots. Uh, at 58 Sutton, we changed the rules of the game. No one had ever done, I hate 432 Park Avenue, I hate it so much. And I couldn't do anything because the council's parochial and there's a border, but when they were gonna do it in my district, I said, yes, this is a good thing because I can do whatever I want. And all the tools I talked about, we did been in your building and almost every building in Sutton. I went building by building asking them, what's your capital reserve? Set aside 10% for a legal challenge. We raised over $1.5 million. We hired lawyers, we hired everyone we needed, 
and we rezoned before the developer could finish their foundation. We won. Then, I, and I'm getting the hook, so I'll be very quick. Then they went to the BSA, which is completely appointed by the mayor, and the BSA said, no, this is fine. We'll grandfather it anyway. So now I'm in court, uh, both as a plaintiff and as a pro bono counsel to the community. Uh, we've been working with friends of the Upper East Side Historic District with member items, and they've proposed a 210-foot height cap. The city planning said, absolutely not. So then we came back and said, what about if we close the loopholes? Uh, between now and March 8th, every community board in the city will be uh, asked to comment on getting rid of mechanical voids. Uh, you have the Vignoli building on East 62nd Street. You can learn more at benkalos.com slash void. There's a petition. Please sign it. But we're trying to close that loophole. We're going to be back in the summer uh, to close the loophole in commercial districts. And uh, I'll just share uh, one last thing before I definitely get the hook, which is there's the fights you don't know about. There's the fights where somebody walks up to me and says, I see that historic building that has an RFE on it, and it hasn't been calendared yet, and I'd really love to put up a 700-foot tower where that historic school is or historic library is, and we'd really be grateful if you know what I mean. <laughs> and I've told them no. Then they come back again with more lobbyists and more threats, and I say no again. But you haven't ever had to hear of the story before or again because you had the elected official with the vote who just said no. And I've started to lose count of the number of times we've done it. And it happens because I have the support of my historic districts organizations. Uh, my calls to action for you. Give to your local conservancy organization. Give time. You're here. Thank you. Please give money. Give money from your friends. Give money from your loved ones. Give, give, give. And please help elect a future government that will preserve our past. Thank you so very much. Um, please a hand for, for the council member. Okay, now I'm going to get, now I get to be a little dictatorial. We have, uh, we're running a touch late, but now is the time where you go vote. Vote, 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 vote for what we get to do with the rest of our day. If you do not have or you misplaced or uh, your, your, your little red dots, Michelle's got them outside, got, has more outside at the table. Vote, vote like your, your, like your day depends on it and then uh, come back talk and everything will be revealed. The first panel, the first panel will start 11, maybe 11.05 upstairs on the third floor. Thank you very much. Talk to you many times. <laughs>